Hi, I'm Terry Bills, the Transportation Industry Manager here at Esri, and today I'm joined by Eric Rodenberg, a Solution Engineer on our transportation team. Uh, we'd like to welcome you to another in a series of webinars designed for Departments of Transportation. So today's webinar is focused on how the ArcGIS platform can support you through the full snow fighting and snow maintenance life cycle. We'll highlight how you can improve your snow fighting operations, how you can better communicate your progress with the public, and ultimately how you can optimize your performance to save money and resources. I'd like to point out that we're recording this webinar, and while everyone will be on mute, there will be time for question and answers at the end of the presentation. You can type your questions into the question box, and we'll try to answer as many as time allows. Additionally, the slides which are part of this webinar will be available to you on the GeoNet group, Departments of Transportation, and we'll give you the link and other links at the end of the webinar. So when we say that the ArcGIS platform can support you through the full life cycle of snow fighting activities, this includes starting at the planning stage. So critical components of planning include establishing a route hierarchy and an efficient routing plan ahead of major events. For cities, this often includes a plan of the major arterials, while for state DOTs, priority often goes to clearing the freeways through major cities and other heavily traveled areas. ESRI's routing technology can help you come up with an optimized plan that respects these hierarchies, or in fact, we have a number of partners who can assist you with these routing tasks. Secondly, and essential to an effective snow fighting plan is the ability to monitor real-time weather changes and events. And while obviously many DOTs have their own road weather information or RWIS systems, these should be supplemented with good weather forecasts and real-time monitoring of weather events. Knowing when a major event will hit and being able to pre-position your resources is critical to effective snow fighting. NESRI has several weather services available, and we can help you select the most appropriate weather service for your needs. And a number of these services can be configured to send you real-time alert messages and warnings. And central to an effective snow operation strategy is the ability to track your snow plows and to pull critical information back to your operations center. Increasingly, this information includes not just the location and heading of the plow, but other key information, such as whether the blade is up or down, how much material is being spread, and where. Not only is this information the centerpiece of your ability to effectively monitor your operations, but when archived gives you a great resource to use analytical tools to understand how you can be more effective in the future. The next step in the life cycle is ultimately communicating with the public. The public wants to know what has been plowed and what hasn't. In addition, they often want to register complaints or place requests for service. Being able to effectively communicate your progress through an easy to understand map interface is an important component of building trust and confidence in your efforts. And finally, with business intelligence tools like Esri's Insights, you can analyze your performance and understand how you can improve in future events. And several DOTs have reported significant savings by going back and analyzing their past performance to understand how they could optimize and be more efficient. So this ultimately completes the cycle with feedback into next year's planning process. So much of what you're going to see today in the, in the demo is based on Esri's SnowCop template and solution, which is designed to give you the essentials required to implement these components into your snow fighting regime. We'll give you the links for this template at the end and the bundled solution at the end of the webinar. But you will notice that in a single view, you get to see the location of your existing plows and understand any existing service requests, among other features. And central to this template solution is the ability to help you answer the question, were you meeting the expectations of your citizens and the media by providing them with the information they need, when and where they needed it? 
I did want to highlight a great work that Iowa DOT did with their winter cost calculator. As you can see, you can zoom into any part of the state and then see the total snow clearance costs, the labor, the materials, and the equipment costs. And in addition, you can click on any highway segment and see the costs for that local segment. I think it's a great example of public transparency and obviously one of the reasons that it is up for a 2017 State Scoop Award. To finish this section, I think it's increasingly that there is a public expectation that your state or your city is going to be using the latest technologies to, man to effectively manage snow in your communities and to use those same technologies to communicate your progress as, to the public as well. But rather than me talking about it, let me turn it over to Eric Roddenberg, who's going to walk you through the SnowCop application and show you how it works. Eric? Thanks. Thanks, Terry. All right. So, um, there we go. All right. So, you should be able to see my screen by now. Um, I'm going to talk through the components that are required to deploy SnowCop. I'm going to talk about how you um, configure the real-time component with the GeoEvent server. And uh, then I'm going to show you how the SnowCop works, a couple of different ways you can deploy it, and then I'll show an, uh, the winter cost calculator that Iowa deployed just as an example of a post-storm analysis that can be done once um, you begin tracking your real-time operations, your snow maintenance operations. So to get started, I just want to get, get you up to speed on a couple of the components required um, and some of the traditional problems we run into. In, in, in today's world, GIS data typically represents a state at a specific moment in time. So a state of your data at a specific moment. You might see a uh, road um, or a sign condition as of when it was last collected, if a sign was collected, if a sign's condition was collected in the last week, you're seeing that state of the sign at that moment in time until someone goes out, inspects it again, or replaces it, or does something to it that that makes it um, that makes its status change. So you might see things in the past, you might see current condition, you might see um, what something might look like in the future, like if we are going to do a new road design and we want to compare what it currently looks like versus what um, what the future holds for that uh, maybe an intersection that's that's being updated. So that's one of the things we see mo mostly with the data we work with. Real time data is a little different though. Real time data provides a continuous stream of events, and as you're going to see in a few minutes, lots of data comes in at a given time on um, on certain types of real time data. When anytime I'm tracking vehicles. Uh, you're going to see a tremendous amount of data flow through the system, and, and we need to make sure we capture that. Uh, weather data, sensor data, it might be a little bit different intervals, but the point is, is you'll you'll see a lot of data flow through any any given time when you're dealing with real time GIS data. Um, and so the challenge is, how do we capture that information and then show it on a map? Uh, that 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 part at the beginning, capturing it is a challenge and so ArcGIS supports that challenge through the GeoEvent server. So I can collect uh, real-time data feeds whether it's from an AVL, it could be from sensor data, I might be getting data from collector so when someone does an inspection on an asset like a guardrail, like a um, attenuator on a guardrail, they might report that that attenuator is destroyed and needs to be replaced. Well we might have some type of alert that's listening, that the GeoEvent server is listening for as it queries that incoming feature and it sends a notification off to someone to let them know that an inspector found a, a damaged attenuator that needs to be replaced. And that might kick off a whole series of workflows like, um, like uh, a work order. The point is, is you've got lots of different data coming in and the GeoEvent server processes that information and then pushes it off to my portal through uh, through its server connection. So it's it's writing that data into the portal, 
and then I can display it through uh, applications like the operations dashboard or through a web application or maybe a, through a mobile app. So the, the data is coming in and the GeoEvent server allows me to get it out. And um, the GeoEvent server works on the principle of this idea of connectors. So we have what are called input connectors that you might see here on the uh, on the left. Um, the input connectors allow me to bring data in from a number of different sources. I might bring data in from my AVL feed. I might bring data in from Twitter, Instagram, uh, maybe G, uh, RSS, GeoJSON, uh, even Waze. I can pull in data coming from Waze. I can suck that in and process it ask questions of it, and then display that on the map. And vice versa, I can write data back out to Waze as well. So, um, so these connectors allow me to process the information. So as information comes in, we have what are known as uh, uh, filters and processors. So filters allow me to do queries against the data as it comes in, and processors allow me to um, do some action against the data, like I want to trigger an alert, uh, a, an alert feature class, or uh, so when a truck is speeding, maybe I have a snowplow and I don't want my snowplows going over 25 miles an hour over a bridge, I could, I could trigger a feature alert that sits on top of the snowplow on the map that blinks red that shows that, hey, that snowplow is driving too fast. Um, we can also take advantage of what are known as uh, geofences. So when maybe instead of telling someone after the fact that the truck is going too fast over the bridge, we might have a geofence out in front of the bridge, maybe a half a mile away. And when that truck enters that geofence, they get a warning on their mobile device that tells them, hey, you need to slow down, you're approaching a bridge. So uh, there are a number of different ways we can process this data and then once we've processed it, it goes out through an output connector. And output connectors can write data to a number of different places. I can write data off as features. I can write out alerts through email, through an instant message application like Skype. Uh, I could write it out to a text message. I can write data out through WebSockets. So we have what's known as a streaming service that utilizes web sockets and it basically is just like turning on a, a faucet and letting water run through it. In this case, we're letting all those features flow right into the browser and displaying on the map where the position of a vehicle is or where where um, where uh, maybe what what sensor is going off. Um, I can even write data into, into Hadoop uh, or uh, a number of other locations, files. So uh, you've got a lot of options when it comes to connectors, and I'll, I'll share some of those with you. Um, the number one question we get is, where do I start with the connectors? How do I pull in my AVL feed? Well, a lot of that's going to depend on the type of AVL you have deployed on your snowplow. So in many cases, we run into DOTs that have many different vendors just because of the challenges that the different trucks may have or the challenges that each of the different spreaders may have. Not every AVL is going to be compliant with every uh, brand of spreader. So we've got, we've got support for Network Fleet. We've got support for um, Trimble, uh, Sierra Wireless, um, NMEA, uh, and there are a number of others. In addition, we have a, a, a bunch of different um, we have a bunch of different vendors um, who, who business partners who also can provide their own connectors into the various um, um, AVL providers, like Motorola, for instance. So, so there are lots of different um, business partners out there that can help you with this too. Getting that feed that's coming in to connect. So, uh, here are a couple other feeds. We have FlightAware, um, ActiveMQ. Um, so you can see there's a lot of different there's a lot of different types of feeds I can connect into. Um, you may have your vendor provide you with a GeoJSON or a JSON service or or um, maybe a, um, a web socket, and you can just pull that feed in directly. That's another way to go, and I'll, I'll show you here how I set mine up with Iowa DOT data coming from their open data site in just a minute.
uh, for my demo. Um, but there are a number of different resources we have out of the box. Uh, we also have a, a software development kit for the GeoEvent server. So we, as a company, ESRI, our professional services group, can write custom connectors. Our business partners can write custom connectors. And if you have developers on staff, you can also write custom connectors. So that is how we're able to write the connectors that are out there. Um, in addition, uh, the GeoVent server is, um, is based on this idea of web services. So I can connect to real-time data. I can analyze it. As I mentioned, we can send updates out to, to users. So there's a number of different ways we can connect with our users. And then everything works through web services. So this green box represents an input connector that could be coming in from my AVL. So I might have a Motorola connector that's providing my locations of all my snowplows. And I have what we mentioned earlier as processors and filters. So a filter may look and see if a particular snowplow is within a specific district territory. And um, if it's inside its proper territory, it's written into a feature service. In addition, I might have a processor that is checking the speed of that vehicle. So the AVL is, in most cases, the AVL is going to be looking at a number of different, um, a number of different components of the snowplow. It's going to be looking at the velocity, the heading. It's going to be looking at the snowplow, whether it's up or down. It might be looking at the spreader to see if it's engaged. Um, it might be looking to see if pre-wet's being applied, what the application rate of the snow of the spreader is. So there are a number of different fields that can be tracked and, and queried against. So this one here is, is doing a query against speed. And like I said earlier, if, if a snowplow is going over a bridge faster than 25 miles an hour, maybe we're concerned about what's on the other side of the bridge. Could be a, an underpass, it could be a bike trail, uh, could be a, a subway platform or a train platform into the city and we want our snowplow drivers to understand that if they go flying over the bridge that snow is going to be flying pretty fast so we want to have a way of tracking that so the speeding detector or this processor all that's all it's doing is doing a query of the current speed of the vehicle when it sees that it's over 25 miles an hour it might fire off an email or it might fire off an SMS message so that is how all of this works. And then since this feature service is, it, it, I can add that to a map. I can add that to my uh, uh, Snowcop operations dashboard application. I could add that to a custom web application. I could add it into a mobile device, in, into a mobile application. There are a number of different ways I can work with that feature once I'm writing information out. And then, of course, emails, text messages, all that stuff can be directed to a phone or to any um, email service. So I'm going to start here by just showing you how I'm working with the data I'm working with today, which is Iowa DOT. So I went to the uh, open data portal for Iowa DOT, and I went into their operations section. And um, on page three, so I'm going to scroll down here to the bottom. On page three, they have their AVL direct service. Actually, I'm sorry, that was page two. They have their ADL direct service. So this is their, um, this is all active Iowa DOT vehicles traveling more than three miles per hour. So I'm going to go ahead and click on this and you'll see here, um, you see their plows are out right now and um, I could download a static data set, but that's really not going to do me any good here because I want to evaluate this real time. If you look at the APIs, I have, um, they've given out, uh, they publish out a GeoJSON API through the Open Data Portal. We automatically publish out GeoJSON and the regular REST service. So in order for me to use the REST service, I have to have credentials with Iowa DOT's ArcGIS Online. Here with the GeoJSON service, I can just, I can just evaluate this. So I copied this. And in my portal, actually, let's go to my GeoEvent server. So in my GeoEvent server, this is my manager where I manage all of my inputs, 
all of my services and all the output data. I have this Iowa DOT AVL Direct service that I created. It, it's an input connector that evaluates GeoJSON. So I went in and I clicked Add Input, and I searched through all these different um, connectors. So I can pull an ArcGIS server. I can pull an external website for JSON. I can pull for XML. And I chose this guy, this GeoJSON poll. And um, let's edit this. And you'll see here, this is the URL that I pulled straight from the open data site, pasted it in. I created what's called a GeoEvent definition, which is essentially the schema. So when the Geo JSON feed is read by GeoEvent server, it identifies all the fields that are coming in with that data set. And I um, set up what I, what's known as a GeoEvent definition, which is that schema. So that's what this guy is here. And then the method I'm using is get that data. So every time an update happens, I'm getting it. And then I'm looking for the last modified. Now, I, um, last modified date, it's looking at the HTML header. And it should be pulling in the last time that data was updated and replacing whatever's there with what whatever is new. So, um, and I'm checking every five seconds. Now, this data is updated every minute, but different plows, depending on when they turn on, get updated at different times. So, by setting my time a little bit quicker, I'm making sure that I'm getting all plow activity in, in, in the fleet that's out there. So I'll go ahead and cancel this. So that's what this looks like. So that's the input. Over here in my outputs, <clears throat> you have a couple of different options. So the first option is I can add a feature. And this just adds the geo event that's coming in, in this case from the GeoJSON open data feed, and it's writing it into a feature service. The problem with doing that, and this is a hosted feature service, right? So this could be a feature service hosted on a portal, ArcGIS Online. You could actually write this into an ArcGIS server service as well. The thing you have to be careful of with that is that SQL, if, it's a, if, if the velocity of the data coming in is too much, SQL is not going to be able to keep up. And I've seen that a numerous times where SQL just gets overwhelmed and stops running. So if you're running an, on a SQL database or an Oracle database, they might not be fast enough to keep up with this data, depending on what it is. So uh, snow plows coming in every 30 seconds will likely be too much. So we have an option called a stream service. And stream services use a functionality or a, a protocol called WebSockets. So Chrome, Internet Explorer, um, Firefox all support WebSockets. And a WebSocket is literally like turning on a faucet and letting all the data flow through into the browser. So you're going to see everything captured. And this data should be updated every time a new request comes in based on that query I have. So. Um, so the WebSocket is a way of visualizing the data. So a stream service allows you to visualize. And that's all it's going to do is allow you to visualize the data on a map. It's not going to store it. It's not going to offload it. It's just going to stream it through the browser. So you might be thinking to yourself, well, that's great, but I have to store this data as public record. We have an option for that, too. So in 10.4, we released a product, or it's actually part of portal for ArcGIS and the GeoEvent server. It's called the ArcGIS Spatiotemporal Big Data Store. So for the rest of this session, I'm going to refer to that as the Big Data Store. The Big Data Store is for storing billions of points. And, and we, have, we have validated that it can store billions of points. You can throw as many features that you, as you want at it. Typically speaking, to kind of give you some context for what it can do, a typical feature service is going to be able to support about um, a thousand features a second. So if I'm writing 
data into a SQL database through a feature service, it can support anywhere from 700 to 1,000 features. If you've got that geodatabase tuned to accept that kind of a data set, and that's the only thing it's accepting. So I'm not, this isn't the same production server where I've got all my publication services running. This is its own instance of SQL where I'm, all I'm doing is writing in real-time data. So a SQL database about 700 to 1,000 features. A stream service can take about 10,000 features a second. So as you can imagine, the stream service is awesome because I can just throw anything I want at it. A spatial temporal big data store can support up to a million features a second. And the reason it's doing that is because on the back end, it's running what's known as Elastic, uh, Elastic Search. Elastic Search is an, is an open, um, and this is all black box under the hood, but I'm just letting you know what's going on behind the scenes. The Elastic Search database is an unstructured open data or big data um, uh, container and it can store all kinds of data. And the way I've got my configuration set up is I've got it set up with multiple nodes. So I'm writing data to multiple nodes. So I can, I can easily write up to 20,000, maybe even 100,000 features a second without any problem. Um, but depending on how you have it tuned, if you, if you tune it in the cloud and you've got lots of data coming in, you can easily get a million features. So it's high performance and it's designed to work with lots of data. So I've got a big data store set up to archive all of my data. So I'm going to click here on the site so you can see this. And I'll click down here on my spatial temporal big data store. And it's, for some reason, started telling me this morning that nothing's connected, but it's there. Um, so I'm going to go back to the services. I know it's there because it is writing out features and it's well over. Uh, I reset the statistics earlier today and there's probably about 12,000 features in this right now that I've been running uh, since I've been running this uh, at uh, 6 a.m. this morning. So um, there's about 12,000 features in this, in this archive and uh, if I click on this, There it is. Yeah, this has been acting weird this morning. But anyway, um, it's writing quite a few features in. I've got this set to um, basically blow these features away every three days. So uh, one of the things you can't see here at the moment is when you create a, a, a big data store feature service, you can set it up to keep the features indefinitely. You can wipe them every day, every hour, every 10 minutes, every year, however you want to do it. Um, and it, what it does is it creates a feature service and a uh, map service. And you can see here I've got a map with, um, and I'll bring in the the stream service first. So I'll go ahead and activate this. Um, so let's bring in and start streaming these points. And uh, if you give it a second here, you'll see these things um, draw on the map. I don't see this drawing. I am going to turn on the archive, and you will see those points. So the archive is showing me my snow tracks. And you'll notice here, I'm showing this as a, as a map service. And what you'll notice here is the map service is rendering, um, what it does is these, it, 
it generates these hexagon bins. And a hexagon bin is just a polygon, and inside that polygon, it's telling me the number of features um, that it has it has stored for that particular polygon. So you'll see here I've got 179 tracks in this area. There's my stream service, so that you can see the stream service now. Let's turn this off, the archive. So you see these blue points on the map. Those are my uh, those are my snowplow locations, and I can click on this, and I can get the attributes and you can see here in the attributes, we've got the ID of the, the snowplow. We got the time that um, this was logged. And the times are going off of UTC, I believe. So that's why this looks goofy, um, showing 8.25 AM. Um, you see the XY coordinate value, the heading, which is the direction it's facing. And I've got all my arrows rotated by the heading. So everything is rotated to show the direction the snowplow is moving in. We see the velocity, and then you see some information that currently is not being collected by the vehicle. So road temp, air temp, solid liquid material. So I can see exactly what solid material is on board. Um, if, they're, if they're actually in a snow event, I would be able to see the solid material on board, the liquid material, the pre-wet material, which are, all crucial comp, which are all crucial to that Iowa cost calculator, right? You can't do that kind of analysis unless you understand what is on the vehicle and how much is being applied. So I can see the state of the plow. There's the wings. If it's got wings on it, I can see the state of those, whether they're up or down. Uh, the underbelly plow, um, you can see uh, the application rates, so the solid rate, the liquid rate, the pre-wet rate. Um, and then you can see the um, who it was created by when it was updated last. So, uh, and then the active material on board. And there are 37 trucks out at the moment, so we got all that information. Now, if I just wanted to see where this truck has been, I can call up, uh, and I'll turn off the lo the active locations. I'll call up the uh, the archive. So again, the archive renders everything as a hex bin at the small scales. As I start to zoom in, we'll actually see the tracks. So you see here, these hex bins re-render and get finer and finer as I zoom in. And now you see the actual tracks. So this archive is showing me every snowplow that's been out and its breadcrumb trail, if you will. So that's the point of the archive. If I need to go back, let's say someone called the state and said, hey, you know, my windshield got blown out or my car was hit or my property was damaged by your snowplow. I have a way of going back now through, this, through the Spatial Temporal Data Store and looking at that information and seeing if my snowplow was ever there at that time. I can also go back and look at the history of my application rates and what, when my snowplows were up or down. So if you remember earlier, we talked about that that information is crucial. Well, this allows me to take that and basically replay it and see just what the applications look like, application rates look like. So if you're a state that is working with contractors and you want to make sure they're dropping the proper amount of material, this is a great way to track that and make sure that they're being honest with what they're, they're doing. And uh, basically, this allows you to provide them with grades, with report cards every, every, after every season showing what they did right, what they didn't do, and then you can have a tool now to tweak your um, to tweak how you're going to manage your your contractors or even your own drivers for that matter and manage your supplies you can get an accurate count of what's being dropped how how much is being dropped and if that was adequate enough for a particular snow event and I can of course color code these now I'm looking at the the map service so the map service is set in stone but if I drop the feature service in, I can color code these, these points however I want. I can color code them by whether or not the plow was up or down, whether or not they were dropping uh, material, if it was solid or liquid. Um, I could, I could uh, symbolize by the, by the truck ID or by the truck type if I had that information. So uh, you've got a lot of options here once you're collecting those trucks and where they've been. And I can even take this archive and I can play it back 
as a time animation. So I can uh, go in, set up the playback speed, set the time. So we'll start this as of this morning at 5 a.m. up until it's 1.30 for me, 1.30 in the afternoon. We'll play it up to, and we'll do this in uh, one hour. Uh, we'll do 30 minute intervals. And now you can see um, we've got an animation that's built out over time, and let's play it. It looks like So you can see all my snow tracks and how the trucks were driving, what the speed was of the truck. So if I wanted to go back here, let's go back, let's pause that. And I just wanted to query those trucks at that point in time. I could see that, okay, this truck was driving 27 miles an hour. Or this guy was driving at uh, 23 miles an hour. So I've got a record of where they were, how fast they were driving. I can see all that information. And so then when I want to go back and do my analysis, I've got all the information I need to do it. And, and, and that's what this provides. And I built this in a web map with the idea of eventually sharing this into a snow cop. So I've got some layers I want to see. I've got weather, which is all coming from ArcGIS Online, by the way. This is all free layers. So this, this National Weather Service layer is providing me with the weather. I'm pulling in the World Traffic Service, which I've um, shared out so I can publicly share it. I've got Iowa DOT cameras. And if I zoom in enough, we also have temperature uh, sensors around the, the state. Here, I can just turn on their um, there we go so the temperature sensor is showing me the direction of the wind and the current temperature so I can click on this and get all the other information so I can see it's what the dew point is I can see it's overcast and I can see uh, how fast the wind is moving so 20 miles an hour so I can even display that as a label, the, mi the miles per hour of the, uh, of, the wind, of the weather. And then I've got all my cameras, so I can click on a camera, and that's going to provide me with the image. So all this information, again, easily configured. Um, all the links are in the pop-ups uh, for the, 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 the image feed. Um, again, the weather sensor data. I could even pull the weather sensor data into GeoEvent and trigger off alerts through uh, what the weather sensors see. So if the dew point hits, you know, 27 and the temperature hits 32, I might send alerts out to all my district supervisors telling them, okay, it's time to get your snow plows out. We've got weather approaching. So there are a number of different things we can do um, with this data. And again, if I wanted to pull those weather sensors in, I would create a new input. And I would, in this case, since that's a, a, geo, a feature service, I would pull that feature service and, and then build out my notifications so that when the temperature got down to a certain temperature, boom, alerts are firing off. All right, so that brings us now. So you've seen we've got the trucks. We've got the cameras, traffic, weather. I've got all the data sets I want to see in my snow cop. How do I get snow cop deployed? So there's a couple ways you can do this. So I went into the solutions page, it's solutions.rts.com, and you'll see here I'm in the transportation, I'm in state government transportation. So I'm in the gallery for, um, and I'll provide a link to this at the end of the webinar um, so that you can get to it easy. So I'll go to state government transportation and I'll click on snow cop. Let's learn more. And this is going to open up all the help documentation for the snow cop. So requirements, what you get, what's new, and then the view down, the view applications. So um, 
you'll start by going through what you get, and then at the very bottom, you want to get started with Snowcop. This is going to tell you how to do it. So this is going to tell you how to publish your services, create your map, and then monitor your snow response application. And um, there's an easier way to do it, though. So this requires you to basically pull all your own services together and make sure your schemas match up. And it takes a little bit of work um, to go this route when you go through the, the, the gallery and just download these and deploy them. The best way to actually do it is through ArcGIS Pro. So in, um, gosh, I guess it was sometime last year, the ArcGIS Solutions team deployed this new tool called the ArcGIS Solutions Deployment uh, Tool. And what this allows me to do is sign, it basically, basically configures the whole application for me. It prepares all the feature services, and then it allows me to load my data into them. You cannot make this any easier. And I mean that. I mean, this is really simple. So you start by, by signing in. So I would sign into my organization, which you can see here I'm signed in at the top right. Um, it knows that I'm logged into the Esri Transportation Practice Organization. So I click Finish. Then I'm going to deploy my solution. So we'll open that task up. And now it's going to... It's basically reading through all the all the ArcGIS uh, solutions, and it organizes them by the vertical market, by the market. So if um, we're in state government now, there there are two versions of Snowcop. They're identical. There's one for local government and one for state government. I'm going to just type in Snowcop here, because if you go to state government, you won't find it. In in this in this tool, you won't find it. So I'm going to type in Snowcop. Hit enter, and you'll find that it's under the local government section. Now, I'm telling you this because it is identical, so you are not getting something different by going to the local government one. So I would click on this guy, and I would hit deploy. And this is taking the template and basically downloading it, uploading it to my ArcGIS Online account, and it's going to create all the feature services for me. So every feature service that's inside a Snowcop is going to be available. Then you'll, as you saw, I've got my own, um, I've got my own Snowplow stream service, and I've got my Snowplow feature service that I could add in to track where my snowplows are. So I've got that part done. This is going to configure all the other services. So um, while this is running. Let's take a look at those service. Let's take a look at the final app. So this is the Snowcop app, and it's going to show me by my maintenance districts what activity has been done. So um, the maintenance districts is a layer I would have to have. So if you've got your districts, you'll basically load those into the maintenance districts layer, along with all the drivers who are deployed in those districts. So then I can see who my drivers are, and I can see what type of equipment they're driving in, who, what department they work for. So if they're a department employee or if they're, a, if they're a contractor, and I can see what activity is being done based on the mileage of roads versus what they have, what they've currently driven across. So it looks at that data. So it's looking at what's out there to drive and what they've currently done to give me an idea of what has been planned and, and what percent of what's been planned is complete. And so you can see the points moving around on the map. Um, and then the next tab shows me service requests. So service requests are, um, you might have an app set up where the state police or your trusted, uh, your trusted partners, whether it's state police, local law enforcement, uh, could be um, local public works departments are calling up and saying, hey, you know, the snow's getting bad out here. It's snowing three inches an hour. Um, snow's starting to pile up. Um, you guys need to get somebody down here on the state route or on these inter interstate ramps. So um, these requests in black are, represent public requests. And those requests could come from Survey123 or they could come from a geoform. 
So I could deploy a Geoform or a Survey123 survey that I give to all my state police officers. And since we can do public surveys now, it would be easy to set that up for those officers so that they could get in and report any incidents that they see. So if they don't want to call in, which I know in some states, it's, it's every state's a little different, but we've got some states where they'll call it in, some states will, um, they, they are actually doing work like this where someone can get in online through an app, through a web app or through a mobile app and actually submit a request. And then this plow activity is looking at um, actual plow activity versus planned plow activity. So again, that's looking at, here's what we've currently driven based on our GPS tracks. And by the way, those tracks can be turned into features, right? So I can turn um, one of these tracks, I could turn this track into a feature, into a line, and then compare that line distance against the snow route that that driver is assigned to, to figure out what's been done versus what's left to do. And I could do that through geoprocessing and have those answers in a couple of minutes. It, not even a couple of minutes, probably a minute. So, um, so then you've got this, this chart reflects that information. Okay, finally, finally, um, let's go back to Pro. So Pro is got this finished. I'm going to finish this step, and then it's going to let me configure the solution. So the solution it's telling me is it's got feature layers with domains, um, and then it's telling me if I need to make any modifications, I can make those modifications here. So I'm, so it's just warning me about that. So then the next step is to actually add my field. So I would add my fields for each of my um, each of the uh, various um, layers that I'm going to be working with, and and, um, and then when I'm finished with that step. I can add all my domains in, so I'm going to skip through this, and then the last thing I'm going to do is load my data into those layers. So you'll basically be loading your, your districts in, um, you'll be loading in your um, service requests, and then configuring geoforms or uh, survey123 to that, to that feature service. Um, you'll be configuring your um, routes so your snowplow routes, and then you'll be configuring um, your, uh, that's basically it, those three layers. So the service requests, the, the um, routes, and then your um, districts. And then the snowplows themselves, that's just coming from those, uh, that's either the stream service, the big data store feature service, or the big data store map service, whatever one you prefer to show. All right, so then finally, once you've got your snow cop up and running and you're pulling down that information, you can deploy an application like the winter cost calculator that Iowa built. And um, this is actually the template they used. This is a web app builder template. Um, it is the summary template. And basically what this does is as I zoom in, it's going to summarize what it sees on the screen. So as I move around the map, these numbers will change based on the routes visible in this map section. So I can then see that, okay, $19,000 was, was spent in eastern Iowa. Uh, they spent $5 on material. There was $10,000 on labor, $8,000 of equipment. And then I can see the number of pounds of salt applied and the labor hours. And I can also click on any segment and get the individual segment costs. So I can see exactly what labor was spent on a segment of road, what the, what the material costs were, and what the equipment costs were. Again, all that is coming from the data that it's based on those, a lot of that data is based on the application rates and then just knowing what your costs are for your vehicle maintenance and labor for however many hours that a particular driver or drivers were out. So um, it's pretty impressive, but the 
key to that is a good AVL that you can capture that information. And um, GeoVent server provides that foundation. And then with Snowcop, I can see visually where my plows are, what activity is going on, what's been done, what's not been done. And then through the winter cost calculator, I can go back and do analysis after the fact on the storm, post-storm. And then with insights, you can dig into that data for an entire year, five years, 10 years, whatever, however many years of data you have, you can go back and look at it and look at the trends and see how you can better prepare for next season and um, how you're going to attack uh, snow maintenance. So that's all I have for today. Um, I think Terry and I are going to open it up now for questions. Um, so we've got about 10 minutes left for questions. Uh, Terry, you want to? Yeah, thanks, Eric. Um, we do have a number of questions so far. So uh, we can start with, uh, uh, and again, let me, uh, if you do have questions, type into the question box and we'll try to get to as many as we can. So there was a question, uh, you made the statement that typically uh, 10,000 features a second uh, was about the limit. Um, um, there was a question as to what, what causes that. Is that a function of CPU, of RAM, or of the architecture? Uh, somebody just wanted to know why that was the, tended to be the upper limit. Yeah, so SQL, um, I think on SQL it's about 700 to 1,000. If I said 10,000, that was wrong. It's, it's 1,000. And the reason there is a limit is that um, when you start writing data into a SQL Server database, it, it can only handle so many. Uh, it can only handle so many threads of. I'm sorry. It can only handle so many threads of data coming in simultaneously before it just breaks. I think um, the maximum number of threads that a SQL Server instance can handle is about 180, and then. Once it hits that max, it's going to start to break down and then just stop accepting data requests. So when, when all that data is coming in, it just overwhelms SQL Server. It'll start missing data, dropping data, and then finally just shut down or just, just basically crash. Um, stream services, on the other hand, since it's an open web socket through a port, it's able to handle basically is the, I think I said the limit there was about 10,000. Um, and then uh, with uh, big data store, it's about 20,000 features. Because it's not being stored in the traditional way that a database stores its data. It's, it's basically an unstructured format. So all the data is coming in. It's being indexed behind the scenes as it comes in. And, um, and it's being written into nodes or machines. So I think I mentioned I have three machines and each node is responsible for so much of that data at a time and then they at the end they all get together and write their data across. Okay, thanks. Um, there was another question having to do with whether uh, there would be a link to this recording, this webinar, uh, and yes, it has been recorded. We do put the re recordings of all past webinars up on uh, the the uh, DOT webinar site, so uh, we'll uh, send everyone the link to that, and you can easily, uh, the same site that you uh, signed up for this webinar, you can actually go back and, and pull up uh, any past webinars, and this webinar will be up there uh, probably by Friday. Uh, there was another question, and uh, kind of an interesting, uh, is there support for a workflow that updates the routes in real time? and based on changes in weather or accumulation of snow. So, uh... Yeah, so we have a number of partners that deal with snow plow routing, and, um, and the, the answer to that is sure, you can. Um, so if I've got um, network analyst and the, the partner solution that deals specifically with snow plows, um, those can be edited on the fly um, and then overwrite the service that has those plows um, or those, those routes. And then a tool like Navigator for ArcGIS, um, later this year, that is going to allow me to push those routes in 
to Navigator. So um, you could potentially push those routes in, but um, but yeah, you can you can update the routes on the fly. Um, now it's just a matter of how you're going to get the route to the driver is yeah. the question. So so that's sort of the equivalent on the package and delivery side of what's called dynamic dispatch and you really want to update your routes in, in real time. Uh, obviously, you do have the ability of monitoring uh, from the snow cop. You can actually uh, be monitoring and make those decisions in the operations center to actually build that in as part of the logic. Uh, that that it would be uh, a bit of a challenge. Uh, as Eric did say, we, we do have partners that actually specialize in those more complex high-density routing solutions like uh, snowplow routing and so forth, and, and we can certainly uh, um, connect you to, to those partners as well. So, all right, other questions? Um, Eric, maybe the, so if somebody wanted to get started, um, is this something that they could typically do on their own? Do we normally recommend a little bit of assistance from Esri? How, what, what would be the best way to, to get started? Yeah, so, so um, I would say that, I would say that it is going to require some help. Um, GeoVent server has got, there's quite a few moving parts to it, and um, Specifically, when you start talking about the big data store, uh, capturing that data, um, I would definitely reach out to you, myself, Keith King, uh, or Terry, who's on the call. Um, we can definitely get you uh, connected with our professional services group, uh, and they can assist with configuring and deploying a GeoEvent server with the portal in the big data store, because that is going to be a requirement. And um, from there, I would also recommend that a system like this be deployed in the cloud because it's just proven to be the most scalable and robust way to deploy a, a real-time solution like this. So thanks. Um, you do see we have uh, the resource page and again, the. Uh, uh, both the webinar as well as these slides uh, will post, uh, and the slides will also be on uh, GeoNet, which you can see at the bottom. Uh, we do have uh, a couple of blogs. If you're interested in any of the articles, uh, we can send those along as well. We do have a, a number of states that I think have done really an outstanding job. We've, we've kind of highlighted the work that I would DOT has done. I would say that you know certainly uh, Iowa and Washington State DOT, some of the early leaders in really developing uh, these great solutions for snowplow uh, tracking, and ultimately how how you communicate uh, uh, that information back out to the public in a really nice, publicly transparent and intelligent way, and then certainly. Uh, Iowa has uh, it's been very very popularly received in the state of Iowa, and I think again that my hats off to the job that they've done. So uh, really a wonderful job. Um, all right. So as I said, we'll go ahead. We will close this off, uh, and if you do have other questions, feel free to uh, reach out to either Eric or I. Uh, and uh, Again, this webinar will be posted on the uh, webinar series. You have the link there uh, and uh, also to the GeoNet, uh, uh, DOT GeoNet group. So with that, uh, we'd like to thank you for your uh, attendance today and I hope you've uh, uh, understood how uh, next winter uh, perhaps you can uh, improve and enhance uh, your snow fighting uh, uh, performance. So with that, Thanks again, and uh, we'll see you uh, next month for the next in our series. Okay, thank you.